I love you already. Um, welcome, web developers. I'm so happy to have you here. My name is Yuna, and I'm very excited to be here today to talk about the latest landings in CSS, UI components, and interactions for the web platform. These are the core capabilities that really bring your websites to life, creating a surface for your users to interact with and to successfully use your product, which is why it's so important and critical that the web keeps evolving to meet these user needs and continually improve. So I'm thrilled that on the Chrome team, we're working on making the web platform a better place for users and for the developers that build for it. Last year, we talked about how we're in a golden era for web UI, with new features landing across browsers at a pace that we've never seen before, unlocking things like intrinsically responsive design with container queries, which was a highly anticipated feature and has finally landed. Logical components using advanced selectors, enabling the previously impossible task of parent selection and more complex styling capabilities. And dynamic color theming with new color spaces and color functions supporting the ability to build accessible interfaces and build theme systems from just a few variables. This year, we haven't slowed down at all. In fact, we've continued to build on our investment in creating the powerful, robust web platform that you deserve. We've had a focus on three primary objectives. The first is to make the web feel super smooth as users navigate the web platform. And this includes native scroll-driven animations and view transitions. The second is to finally make it easy to build UI components and style them, which includes interaction patterns like click away to dismiss and supporting positioning logic for anchoring elements together. These are core features that are platform gaps which shouldn't be so hard to implement. And the third is resolving paper cuts and continually improving quality of life for web developers from layout to architecture. These are the areas that we just wish were a little easier to manage, like writing nested styles and international typography that just works, or being able to style things based on the number of children that they have without resorting to added scripting. These are the kinds of problems that we're solving to build a better web. So I'm excited to get into some of the new features that we've landed, that have landed in other browsers to reach baseline newly available, and talk about what we're landing next. Speaking of baseline, this is a cross-functional initiative to provide better clarity on browser feature availability. Features in this talk will either be baseline newly available, meaning that the feature is supported by all major browser engines recently and therefore interoperable, or not yet available across browsers. So let's get into it. A web experience is fundamentally a call and response between you and your users. And that's why it's so important to invest in quality web experiences and user interactions. And it shouldn't be so hard to build these robust, engaging interactions with the native web platform. No added third-party scripting to manage or to slow down optimal performance. So we've been working on some really big improvements that unlock capabilities that we've never had before on the web platform, from navigating within and between page views. The first is native scroll-driven animations. Like the name implies, this new API enables developers to create scroll-based animations without relying on scroll observers or other heavy scripting. Similar to how time-based animations work on the platform, you can now use a scroller's scroll progress to start, pause, and reverse an animation. So as you scroll forward, you see that the animation progresses. And as you scroll backwards, it'll go the other way around. This lets you create partial or full page visuals with elements animating into and within the viewport, also known as scrolly telling for dynamic visual impact. You can also build more subtle effects like this animation of images as they enter the viewport. And this can be done with just a few lines of code declaratively in CSS along with the rest of your styles. 
First, you set up a CSS animation using keyframes, like any other animation effect, and then use the animation property to attach it. The differences start here, where instead of setting a time-based duration, like one second, you set an animation timeline. In this case, we're using the view function with its default values to track the image relative to the scroll port, which in this instance is also the viewport. And we want this to happen from the moment the image is partially in view up to the point where it's in the center of the scroller at 50%. And you can do this by setting the animation range so that the scroll-driven animation only occurs in a segment of the entire view timeline range. You can animate images, elements, text, or really anything in your view as you scroll. And this demo adds a little bit more dimension with a translation as it scales in and the shadows get deeper. One reason I particularly love this technique of animating elements is that it lends itself so nicely to progressive enhancement. This means that unsupported browsers will get the default user experience, while users on supported browsers will see that little bit of enhanced interactivity. You can use a CSS at supports rule to ensure that only developers on supported browsers get this enhanced animation. And you can combine this with a user preference query to ensure that users with preferred reduced motion don't see this higher level of interactivity. Scroll-driven animations can mean full-page scrolly telling experiences, but they can also mean more subtle animations, like a header bar minimizing and showing a shadow as you scroll a web app. This demo is created by making a few different keyframe animations for the header, the text, the nav bar, and the background, and then applying respective scroll-driven animations to each. While they each have a different animation style, each of the, these get the same animation timeline, the nearest scroller in this case, and the same animation range from the top of the page to 150 pixels. Not only does this native API reduce a code burden that you'd need to maintain, whether that's custom script that you wrote or via an additional third-party dependency, but it also removes the need to ship various scroll observers, meaning some pretty significant performance benefits. And this is because scroll-driven animations work off the main thread when animating properties that can be animated on the compositor, like transforms and opacity, whether you're using the new API directly in CSS or via the JavaScript hooks. Tokopedia recently used scroll-driven animations to enable the product navigation bar to appear as you scrolled. Using the native API has had some serious benefits, both for code management and for performance. Because it eliminated the need for third-party scripting, they were able to reduce the, over, uh, the overhead and maintenance for this feature by eliminating 80% of their scroll-driven interactions code. Additionally, the Tokopedia team saw significant performance improvements in CPU utilization, reducing it from 50% to 2% while scrolling. We know these effects will continue to make the web a more engaging place, and we're already thinking about what might come next, including the ability to not just use new animation timelines, but to also use a scroll point to trigger the start of an animation. And you've likely seen effects like this all over the web. We hope to make this a reality as an addition to this powerful feature set in the months to come. And there are even more scroll features coming to browsers in the future. This demo by Adam Argyle shows a combination of these features. CSS scroll start target to set the initial date and time within the pickers, and the JavaScript snap change event to update the header date, making it trivial to synchronize the data with the snapped event. You can build on this to update a picker in real time with the JavaScript snap changing event like you see here. While these features are only currently available in Canary behind a flag, they unlock capabilities previously impossible or very difficult to build in the platform and highlight the future of scroll-based interactions possibilities. And the tooling for these features has had a nice improvement recently as well. The DevTools animations panel now supports the ability to inspect scroll-driven animations, 
see their start times relative to each other and relative to the scroller, and to scrub through the timeline. This visual representation, along with the new, more declarative API, makes working with scroll-driven animations so much easier. To learn more about getting started with scroll-driven animations, our team just launched a new video series that you can find on the Chrome for Developers YouTube channel. Here, you'll learn the basics of scroll-driven animations from Bramas Van Dam, who's sitting in the front row here, including how the feature works, vocabulary, various ways to create effects, and how to combine effects to build rich experiences. It's a great video series. I highly recommend that you check it out. We've just covered a powerful new feature for animating within web pages. But there's also a powerful new feature called View Transitions for animating between web pages to create a seamless user experience. You might want to transition some small text in a card from one view into a larger title on the next view, or animate a preview image into the following page for a nice user experience. Airbnb is one of the companies who has already been leading the road with experimenting and integrating view transitions into their UI for a really smooth and seamless web navigations experience, from the listing editor sidebar right into editing photos and adding amenities, all within this really nice, fluid user flow. Or maybe you're not switching between pages, and you just have a micro-interaction where your list view is getting updated on a user interaction. This effect can be seamlessly achieved by using view transitions. And the way to quickly enable view transitions in your single page application is as simple as wrapping an interaction using document.startViewTransition and making sure that each element that is transitioning has a view transition name, like so, which you can do inline or dynamically using JavaScript as you create the DOM nodes, which can then also be used to apply custom animations to your view transition. But this can get kind of cumbersome. So the first new update to view transitions this year luckily simplifies this problem and introduces the ability to create view transition classes that can be applied to custom animations. And support begins in Chromium 125. Another big improvement for view transitions is support for view transition types. View transition types are useful when you want a different kind of visual view transition when animating to and from page views. For example, you might want a home page to animate into a blog page in a different way than you want that blog page to animate back to the home page. Or you might want pages to swap in and out in different ways, like in this example, going from left to right and vice versa. Before, this was pretty messy to do. You could add classes to the DOM to apply these styles, but then you would have to remove the classes afterward and manage all of that yourself. View transition types solve this problem. You can set up types within your document.startViewTransition function, which now accepts an object. Update is the callback function that updates the DOM, and types is an array with the types. Another advantage of types is that it enables the browser to clean up old transitions instead of requiring you to do this manually before initiating the new transitions. What makes the web so powerful is how expansive it is. Many applications are not just a single page, but a robust tapestry containing multiple pages. And that's why we're so excited to announce today that we're shipping cross-document view transitions for multi-page application support in Chromium 126. This, yeah, this is an exciting one. <laughs> this is the final and most exciting addition to view transitions on the web platform. This new cross-document feature sets said includes web experiences that live within the same origin, like navigating from web.dev to web.dev slash blog. But this does not include navigating cross-origin, such as navigating from web.dev to blog.web.dev or to another domain, like google.com. One of the key differences with same document view transitions is that you no longer need to wrap your transition in document.start view transition. Instead, you would opt in both of the pages involved in the view transition by using the CSS view transition at rule. 
Now the page navigation itself is the trigger that runs the view transition. For a more custom effect, you can also hook in via JavaScript using the new page swap or page reveal event listeners, which give you access to the view transition object. With page swap, you can do some last minute changes on the outgoing page right before the old snapshots get taken. And with page reveal, you can customize the new page before it begins to render after it has been initialized. And finally, to put it all together, in this demo, you can see that both the names and profile pictures are animating between page views. And note how the URL bar updates as well. These are multi-page view transitions in action. This effect is created by using both the page reveal and the page swap events, along with some other page data and custom animations. And this is just a quick glimpse into the code snippet, a part of it, behind it all. The feature is bright for view transitions, with more exploration and iteration happening to bring even more features, including scoped transitions, which allow you to limit a transition to a DOM subtree, enabling the rest of the page to continue to be interactive and supporting multiple view transitions at the same time. The next one is gesture-driven view transitions, which support dragging or swipe gestures uh, to trigger a cross-document view transition for more native-like experiences on the web. And finally, in the future, we'll have navigation matching in CSS, which lets you customize your cross-document view transitions directly in your CSS as an alternative to using the page swap and page reveal events in JavaScript. To learn more about view transitions for multi-page applications, including how to most performantly set them up with pre-rendering, check out Brahmas Van Dam's talk, Multi-Page Application View Transitions Are Here on the Chrome for Developers YouTube channel. And now let's talk about building UI components. This morning, you heard about how our goal is to build a powerful web made easier. And I think a lot of the advancements in the UI interaction space have certainly aligned with this goal. But when we talk to developers and ask what folks are struggling with, the answer is often customizing and styling form controls. <laughs> Who here has dealt with that? Yeah. yeah, that's like everybody. And we hear you. As a frustrated front-end developer, I also asked myself this question in 2017. Why can we still not style form controls and drop downs? Changing a font or adding a little flag icon to improve user parsing shouldn't mean that you have to completely rip out your code and build a drop down element out of divs, adding scripts to manage the navigation, interaction states, and event changes. Then you also have to add those multimodal user inputs and additional accessibility properties to make it all work well. It's just too hard to do this right. Luckily, I found myself on the Chrome team just a few years later, and with the cooperation of multiple community groups and standards bodies, we're working on a solution. This is a complex problem, touching so many pieces of the platform, from layout and rendering, to scroll and interaction, to user agent styling and CSS properties, and even changes to HTML itself. A dropdown alone consists of many pieces like an open button, a selected value, an arrow indicator, a data list of options that's anchored to that opening button. And this is just a simple dropdown. And the key states that you have to handle are keyboard bindings to enter and exit the navigation and to navigate that interaction, dismiss capabilities when you click away, the ability to close other dropdowns when you open one, tab focus management into the dropdown when you open it, and many other small details. So obviously, it's really painful to do this by hand, but the platform doesn't make it easy either. To fix this, we broke down those pieces, and we're shipping a few primitive features that will enable styling dropdowns, but also do so much more. First, we shipped a global attribute called popover, which I'm excited to announce just reached baseline newly available status a few weeks ago. Popover elements are hidden via display none until opened with an invoker. To create a basic popover, you would simply set the popover attribute on said popover and link its ID to a button with popover target. Now the button is the invoker which opens the popover. 
And this is all you need to create this basic popover. With the popover attribute now enabled, the browser handles many of those key behaviors that I just mentioned. This includes promotion to the top layer, which is a separate layer above the rest of the page, so you don't have to worry about handling Z indexes anymore. Light dismiss functionality, where clicking outside of the popover area will optionally close the popover and return focus. There's also default tab focus management, since opening the popover makes the next tab stop inside the popover, regardless of where it is on the page. It does not have to be a sibling to the element that's invoking it. <laughs> <These are laughs> I know, it's so hard to do this. We need to make it easier. It also has built-in keyboard bindings, where hitting the escape key will uh, exit the popover, or double toggling will return focus and exit the popover. And finally, um, default component bindings, as the browser will semantically connect a popover to its trigger. So you get all of this with one attribute. All you need is the popover attribute, popover target, and an ID on your popover. No JavaScript required. It is important to note that popover does not have any inherent semantic meaning, so you still need to use the proper HTML structures and ARIA to provide more contextual meaning for what the popover element actually is. And additionally, popover does not inert the rest of the page, so that means that it does not make the rest of the page non-interactive. You can use it for menus, tooltips, and other elements. If you do want to focus trap and make the rest of the page non-interactive, you might want to use a dialogue element, and you can do a lot of similar things with those two features. You might even be using the popover API today without realizing it, because GitHub implemented popover on their homepage for their new menu and in their pull request overview, progressively enhancing this feature today already and using a polyfill built by Oddbird with some significant support from GitHub's own Keith Circle to support older browsers. It's pretty awesome to see this in the wild and to see a team so dedicated to great UI, deeply invested in the success of this API. And it's clear why, as it's already had a huge impact for the GitHub team. They've been able to deprecate literally thousands of lines of code by migrating these components over to Popover. Additionally, they have benefited from the top layer management that Popover provides and the built-in accessibility relationships, making it significantly easier to build this complex pattern in the correct way. And when you have popovers, you'll likely want to add some interaction as well. And there are four new features that landed in the past year to support animating popovers. And these include the ability to animate display and content visibility on a keyframe timeline, the transition behavior property with the allow discrete keyword, uh, which transitions discrete properties like display. It puts you in a new transition mode the starting style rule to animate entry effects from display none um, and into the top layer, and the overlay property to control top layer behavior during an animation. These properties work for any element that you're animating into the top layer, whether it's a popover or a dialogue, and altogether it looks like this for a dialogue with a backdrop. First, you set up the starting style so that the browser knows what styles to animate this element into the DOM from. This is done for both the dialogue and the backdrop. Then you style the open state for both the dialogue and the backdrop. So for a dialogue, this open state would be the open attribute. If you're doing this for a popover, it would be the popover open pseudo element. And finally, you animate the opacity, display, and overlay using the allow discrete keyword to enable the animation mode where discrete properties can transition. But popover is just the start of the story. Today, I'm really excited to announce that support for native anchor positioning is now available in Chromium 125, which is landing in stable Chromium-based browsers today. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> this means with just a few lines of code, the browser can handle all the logic to tether two elements to each other. In this example, we have a simple tooltip being anchored to each of these buttons positioned at the bottom center. 
And this one is the same idea, combining popover, anchor, and CSS trigonometric functions to create this fun uh, twirl open effect for this menu, anchoring this menu of options above the button that is invoking the menu, which is this plus sign. You can set up an anchor positioned relationship in CSS by using the anchor name property on the anchoring element, in this case, the button, and the position anchor property on the positioned element, in this case, the tooltip. And then you can apply absolute positioning or fixed positioning relative to the anchor using the anchor function. Here, we're positioning the top of the tooltip, the positioned element, to the bottom of the anchor. Alternatively, you could use anchoring directly in the anchor function, like so, and skip the position anchor property altogether. This can come in handy when you're anchoring to multiple elements, too. Finally, you can use the new anchor center keyword to justify and align properties and center the positioned element to its anchor. While it's very convenient to use anchor positioning with popover, popover is not a requirement of using anchor positioning. It works great with any two or more elements to create a visual relationship. In fact, this demo, inspired by an article from Roman Komarov, shows an underlying style being anchored to these list items as you hover or tab over them. In this case, we're using the anchor function to set up the anchor position using the physical properties of left, right, and bottom. And when we hover over one of the links, the target anchor custom property changes, and the browser shifts the target to apply the positioning styles. We're also animating the color at the same time, creating this pretty neat effect using anchoring. In addition to the default directional absolute positioning that you've likely used before, there's a new layout mechanism that has landed as a part of the anchor positioning API called inset area. Inset area makes it easy to place anchor positioned elements relative to their respective anchors and works on a nine cell grid with the anchoring element in the center. For example, inset area top places the element at the top and inset area bottom does what you would expect it to do as well. With inset area, this can be simplified to this. You can combine these positional values with span keywords to start at the center position and span to the left, span to the right, or span to take up the full set of columns or rows that are available in this space. You may also want to use uh, logical properties instead of directional keywords for inset area, which are also available as a part of this API. To make it easier to visualize and to pick up this layout mechanism, I built a tool at the following URL where you can explore these different position values and copy the code. And because these elements are anchored, the positioned element dynamically moves around the page as its anchor moves. So in this case, we have container query styled card elements which resize based on their intrinsic size, something that you could not do with media queries. And the anchored element will shift to the new layout as the card UI changes. Menus and submenu navigation are so much easier to create with a combination of popover and anchor positioning. But what happens when you hit the edge of a viewport with your anchored element? Well, you can let the browser handle that for you, too. You can do this in a few ways. The first is to create your own positioning rules. In this case, the submenu is initially positioned at the right of the storefront button with the code that's currently shown. But you can create a position try block for when there's not enough space to the right of the menu, and let's call that one bottom. Then you can connect that posi with position try options, explicitly calling it by name like this. So now the browser will switch between these anchored states, trying the right position first and then shifting to the bottom. And the browser can do all of this with a nice transition as well. Along with the explicit positioning logic, there are a few keywords that the browser provides if you want some basic interactions, like flipping your anchor in the block or inline directions. For a simple flipping experience, you can take advantage of these flip keyword values writing a position try definition, uh, skipping the position try definition altogether. So now you can have a fully functional, location responsive anchor positioned element with just a few lines of CSS.
pretty, pretty cool. We see these tethered experiences everywhere, and this set of features is an excellent start to unleashing creativity and better control over anchor positioned elements and layered interfaces. But this is just the start. Currently, popover only works with buttons as the invoking elements, or with JavaScript as the invoker. For something like these Wikipedia-style previews, a pattern seen all over the web platform, we have to make it possible to interact with, but also to trigger a popover from a link and from showing user interest, not necessarily clicking through, but doing something like a hover or a tab focus. So as a next step for the popover API, we're working on interest target to solve these needs and to make it easier to recreate these experiences with the proper accessibility hooks built in. This is a really challenging accessibility problem to solve with a lot of open questions around ideal behaviors. But solving this and normalizing this functionality at a platform level should improve these experiences for everyone. In addition to the interest target invoker, there's an additional future-facing general invoker currently available to test in Canary, thanks to the work of two third-party developers, Keith Circle and Luke Warlow, called Invoke Target. Invoke Target supports the declarative developer experience that Popover Target provides, but for all interactive elements, including dialogue, details, video, input type equals file, and more. We know that there are use cases that aren't covered yet by this API, like styling the arrow that connects an anchored element to its anchor, especially as the position of that anchor moves and shifts, or enabling an element to slide and to stay in the viewport instead of snap to another position when it reaches its bounding box. So while we're excited about this powerful API and about landing these features, we're also looking forward to expanding on its capabilities even more in the future. I talked a bit about styling dropdowns, so you might be thinking, well, it's nice that we're getting these primitives, but what about those dropdowns? The good news is this is something that we have been actively working on for a long time now, and there's been a lot of progress. The bad news is that this API is still very much in an experimental state at this time. However, I'm excited to share some live demos and updates of our progress and hopefully get some of your feedback. First, there has been progress on how to opt users into the new customizable select experience. The current work in progress way to do this is to use an appearance property in CSS set to appearance-based select. Now, keep in mind, this is an experimental API at this stage, so the syntax might change. Once appearance is set, regardless of what the final value name ends up being, you'll be opting into a new customizable select experience. In addition to appearance-based select, there are a few new HTML updates. These include the ability to wrap your options in a data list for customization and the ability to add arbitrary non-interactive content like images and other elements to your options. Finally, you'll have access to a new element selected option, which will reflect the content of the options into itself that you can then use to customize to your own needs which is really, really handy. Here's an example of customizing selected option in the Gmail UI, where a visual icon represents the type of reply that you have selected to save space. You can use basic display styles within the selected option to differentiate the option styling from the preview styling. In this case, text, which is shown in the option, can be visually hidden in selected option. One of the biggest advantages of reusing the select element for this API is having the backwards compatibility story. In this country select, you can see that we have customized the UI to include flag images in the options for easier user parsing of the content. Because non-supported browsers will just ignore the lines that they don't understand, such as the custom button, the data list, the selected option, and the images within the option, the fallback will look like this, which is similar to the current default select UI, identical to the current default select UI. With customizable selects, the possibilities are endless, and I particularly love this Airbnb-style country selector because there's a clever style for responsive design. You can do this and so much more with the upcoming stylable select making it a much-needed addition to the platform. 
Solving select and all the pieces that come along with it isn't the only UI component that the Chrome team has been working on. There are quite a few uh, others as well. And the first addition to uh, the component part of this talk that I want to share is the ability to create exclusive accordions, which is an accordion where only one item is shown at a time. The way to enable this is to apply the same name value for multiple details elements, hence creating a connected group of details much like a group of radio buttons. Another UI component improvement are the user valid and user invalid pseudo classes. Similar to how uh, valid and invalid works, these work only when a user has significantly interacted with the input. And this is stable in all browsers recently. This means significantly less code is needed to determine if a form value has been interacted with or has become dirty, which can be very useful for providing user feedback and reduces a lot of scripting that would be necessary to do this in the past. Another handy component that has landed recently is field sizing content, which can be applied to form controls like inputs and text areas. This enables the size of the input to grow or shrink depending on its contents. Field sizing content can be particularly handy for text areas as you no longer are resolved to the fixed sizes where you may need to scroll up to see what you wrote in earlier parts of your prompt in two small input boxes. The ability to um, add an HR or horizontal rule element into select is another small but useful component feature that landed in baseline this year. While it doesn't have much semantic use, it does help you nicely separate content within a select list, especially content that you might not necessarily want to group in an opt group, like a placeholder value. <laughs> Someone's excited about this feature. I love that. I would bucket all of these smaller changes as quality of life improvements for UI that constantly improve the developer experience when building on the web platform. We're constantly iterating, and it's not just for interactions and components, but there are many other quality of life updates that have landed in the past year. So I hope that you're ready for a little bit of a lightning roundup here at the end. Native CSS nesting landed in all browsers last year and has since improved to support look ahead nesting, which means that the ampersand before element names is no longer a requirement. This makes nesting feel so much more ergonomic and similar to what I've used in the past. One of my favorite things about CSS nesting is that it enables you to visually block components. And within those components include all of their states and modifiers, such as container queries and media queries. Previously, I was in the habit of grouping all of those queries at the bottom of my file for specificity purposes. But now you can code them all in a way that makes sense right next to each other in line with the rest of your code. Another really nice change is the ability to use centering mechanisms like align content in block layout. This means that you can now do things like vertically centering a div without needing to apply flex or grid layout. <laughs> which means that you don't get the side effects from flex and grid, like preventing margin collapse that you might not want from those layout mechanisms. Speaking of layout, text layout got a nice improvement with the addition of text strap balance and text strap pretty. Here you can see the differences between the balanced and pretty headlines versus the unbalanced headlines. Text strap balance is used for a more uniform block of text while pretty focuses on rendering, reducing singletons on the last line of text. We landed even more typographic layout updates for CJK text features, which got a lot of nice updates in the past year, like the word break auto phrase feature that wraps the line at the natural phase boundary. And text, space, text spacing trim, which applies kerning between punctuation characters to improve the readability of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean typography for more visually pleasing results by default. And in the world of color theming, we saw a big update with relative color syntax. In this example, the colors here use OKLCH OK based theming, and the hue value adjusts based on the slider, which changes the entire theme. This can be achieved with relative color syntax. Here, the background uses the primary color of each of these list items based on the hue and adjusts the lightness, chroma, and hue channels to adjust the overall value. 
I is the sibling index in the list, which enables this gradation of values, showing you how you can combine these stepping functions with custom properties and relative color syntax to build out these themes. And along with the light-dark function, theming has become so much more dynamic and simplified. The light-dark function is an ergonomic improvement that simplifies color theming so that you can write theme styles in a much more concise way, as demonstrated so nicely in this visual diagram by Adam Argyle. Before, you would need two different blocks of code, your default theme and a user preference query to set up your theme options, where now you can write these styles in the same line of code using the light-dark function. And I would be remiss to talk about modern UI without mentioning one of the most impactful interop features from the past year, and this has to be the has selector, landing across all browsers in December of last year. This API is a game changer for writing logical styles. The has selector enables you to check if a child has a specific children or if those children are in a specific state, and essentially can function as a parent selector as well. Has has already shown to be particularly useful for many companies, including Policy Bazaar, who uses Has to style blocks based on their interior content, such as this compare section here, where the style adjusts if there's a plan to compare in the block or if it's empty. With the Has selector, they were able to eliminate any added scripting-based validation for the user selection and replace it with a CSS solution that yielded the same results with much less code. These logical style features that required a load of JavaScript to achieve, be achieved in the past can now be done in just a few lines of CSS. Another key addition to the web that is now newly available and growing in usage is container queries, which enable the ability to query an element um, and its parent's intrinsic size to apply styles, which is a much more fine-toothed comb than media queries, which only query the viewport size. Angular recently launched a beautiful new documentation site on angular.dev that used container queries to style the header blocks based on the available space on the page. So even if the layout changes and goes from a multi-column layout to a sidebar with a sidebar to a single column layout, that header block can self-adjust. It owns its own logical styling. And without container queries, something like this was really hard to do. You would have to do resize observers, element observers. Now it's trivial to build something like this based on a parent's element size. And finally, very soon, we're excited to see at property land and baseline. This is a key feature for providing semantic meaning to CSS custom properties, also known as CSS variables, and enables a slew of new interactions possibilities. From something as seemingly straightforward as animating a gradient, to enabling contextual meaning, type checking, defaults, and fallback values in CSS, opening the door for even more robust features like range style queries. This is a feature that was not possible before, but it now provides so much depth to the language of CSS. With all of these new changes and powerful UI capabilities landing across browsers, the possibilities truly do feel endless. New interactions experience with scroll different animations and view transitions make the web more fluid and interactive in ways that we've never seen before. And next-level UI components make it easier than ever to build robust, beautifully customized components without ripping out the entire native experience. And finally, quality of life improvements in architecture, layout, typography, and responsive design not only solve the little big things, but they also give developers the tools they need to build complex interfaces that work on a variety of devices, form factors, and meet user needs. With these new features, you should be able to remove third-party scripting for performance-heavy features like scrolly telling and tethering elements to each other with anchor positioning, build fluid page transitions, and finally style dropdowns, improving the overall structure of your code natively. It's never been a better time to be a web developer, and there hasn't been so much energy and excitement around UI since the announcement of CSS3. Native features that we've needed but have only dreamed of in the past are actually landing now and finally truly becoming a part of the web platform. And it's because it's, 
It's because of your voice that we're able to prioritize and finally bring these capabilities to life. So thank you all for speaking up and doing that. We're working on making it easier to do the hard, tedious stuff natively so that you can spend more time building the things that matter, like the core features and design details that set your brand apart. To learn more about these features as they land, follow along at developer.chrome.com and web.dev, where our team shares the latest in web technologies. Try out scroll-driven animations, view transitions, anchor positioning, or even styleable selects, and let us know what you think. We're here to listen, and we're excited to help. I can't wait to see what you build. Thank you so much. Thank you.